uh, it's basically CSF fistula is uh, defined uh, whenever there is a leak of CSF from intracranial cavity uh, through the uh, defect in the base of skull. So that can the defect can go through the anterior cranial fossa or the middle cranial fossa and communicate with the uh, nasal cavity or the middle ear cavity respectively. So these two are the sites where there can uh, be formation of a CSF fistula. So this implies that there is a defect in the bone, dura and also the adherent pyarachnoid matter because usually CSF is present in the subarachnoid space. So to uh, the CSF to leak into the uh, nasal cavity or middle ear cavity, there should be defect in all three structures, the pyarachnoid matter, the dura matter and the bony defect. So whenever all these three are present, uh, you can see uh, the patient uh, comes with complaints of either uh, rhinorrhea, which is nothing but uh, secretion in the nasal cavity. And if CSF is suspected, it is called CSF rhinorrhea and uh, otorrhea if a uh, patient is complaining of uh, CSF otoria, if patient is complaining of CSF drainage through the external auditory canal. Sometimes there is also a term that is known as rhino otoria. So whenever the tympanic membrane is intact, the CSF that is leaking into the middle ear cavity cannot escape through the external auditory canal. So what happens is anteriorly, what is the structure that is there? So in the anterior part of middle ear cavity, we have the uh, eustachian tube. So the CSF usually goes through the eustachian tube, which is normally closed in physiological states. So when there is a buildup of fluid within the middle ear cavity, there is increase in pressure and that causes opening of the eustachian tube and it leaks through the eustachian tube into the, opens into the nasopharynx and the patient comes with complaints of rhinorrhea. So that is what is called uh, CSF otorhinorrhea. So the etiology, uh, the most common etiology is uh, traumatic. So most of 90% of the cases uh, comes with a history of alleged history of trauma. So it can be either an accidental trauma or uh, there can be a possibility of uh, iatrogenic injury, especially uh, nowadays, most of the uh, neurosurgical procedures have, uh, like there is a increased use of uh, endoscopic or minimally invasive options. So they usually go through transpenoidal route and even in FES also they go through the ethmoidal assholes. So in these cases, there is a high risk of injury to the base of skull. So uh, if there is any atrogenic injury also, there can be involvement of the dura and uh, there can be CSF leak. So most commonly patient uh, presents with uh, rhinorrhea. In 80% of the patients, rhinorrhea is the most common uh, manifestation of CSF leak and in 20% of patients, otorrhea. Because most of the times, uh, otoria won't manifest because the tympanic membrane will be uh, intact. So rhinorrhea is the most common manifestation. Also, in addition to these causes, there are a few other causes, which is uh, one is uh, secondary, which is nothing but anything non-traumatic. So uh, there can be uh, multiple causes which can increase the intracranial pressure. So due to the increase in pressure, there can be uh, erosion of the pressure, erosion of the uh, bones, calvarial bones, and which in turn can cause leak of CSF. And uh, one more important entity is, uh, so previously there was only two causes, like the two major categories, one is traumatic and uh, non-traumatic. And now uh, there is a new uh, etiology for CSF leak, which is spontaneous CSF fistula. Uh, this is most commonly defined in uh, patients who have idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So in these cases, uh, uh, you would have known that uh, there will be increase in intracranial uh, pressure and uh, radiologically it can manifest as empty cella, dilated Meckel's cave and uh, tortuosity of the optic nerve. So in these cases, what happens is due to the increased uh, pressure, there can be hypertrophy of the arachnoid granulations. So the arachnoid granulations usually uh, cause pressure erosion over the calvarium, which in turn results in a bony defect. So that's what we saw the introduction. So let's go into the uh, topic proper. So first is whenever a patient comes uh, with a history of nasal discharge or ear discharge, 
we have to work up for other causes. So the most common cause whenever the patient comes uh, with a nasal discharge is we have to rule out uh, whether there is any possibility of sinusitis, rhinitis, etc. So uh, ENT will be evaluating the uh, patient. So uh, he or she will be evaluating for the uh, causes of the co most common causes of rhinorrhea. And followed by that, if the patient is saying there is uh, a translucent discharge that is especially uh, increased whenever there is valsalva. So which increases in valsalva. So valsalva is nothing but whenever the patient strains or whenever the patient lies in prone position or an early morning discharge. So whenever the patient gets up from the bed. So in these cases, there should be a high suspicion for CSF leak. And also the most important thing is the cause. So uh, there should be any antecedent history of trauma or any other cause which can increase the intracranial pressure. And uh, cause intracranial pressure increase. So we have to rule out these causes. So uh, adequate history taking is important. So followed by that, uh, when we suspect an uh, uh, CSF fistula, so then the patient goes for a clinical uh, laboratory examination that is nothing but beta 2 transferrin levels. So beta 2 transferrin levels are usually uh, seen in CSF. So it is uh, normally not uh, uh, measured uh, whenever a normal nasal discharge or a ear discharge is examined. So it is specifically seen in uh, cerebrospinal fluid. So whenever there is a beta 2 transferrin level positive, then uh, we have to go to the imaging workup. So one more uh, laboratory examination that has been described, but it's not followed uh, in practical scenario is measurement of glucose and protein concentration. So whenever there is uh, more than 30 mg per 100 ml of glucose or more than 45 mg per 100 ml of uh, protein levels. So in those cases, it is highly suggestive that the discharge is suggestive of a CSF uh, component. So, but the uh, you, you have to remember that beta 2 transferrin levels. So, this is the important laboratory examination that these patients undergo. And uh, also, whenever a uh, patient comes with a history of uh, recurrent episodes of meningitis, like without any uh, uh, positive factor, like a uh, patient comes, like uh, he says that he has been treated for like two, three episodes of meningitis over the past uh, three, four years. Then also, we have to suspect CSF leak. Like uh, th there can be uh, like in five to ten percent patients, uh, the patient won't be having a nasal discharge. So only when there is a nasal discharge, then we can do these laboratory examinations, right? So patient won't be having uh, nasal discharge. So these patients come comes with the complaint of recurrent meningitis, and uh, so this should be one of the causes that we need to suspect. Like there must be some defect. It might be some chronic uh, otomastoidus patient with uh, tegment tympani erosion. Like These can be a possibility, but then a CSF leak component should be kept in mind before evaluating these patients. Okay. Yeah, good evening, everyone. So coming to imaging, so the patient comes, so you suspect that it is highly likely of a CSF uh, fluid, whether it's rhinorrhea or otorrhea and uh, you do a beta 2 transferrin level and it is also raised and then the patient is worked up for imaging. So what, what will be the imaging modality that we do? So what are the uh, uh, role that uh, of a radiologist uh, in evaluation of CSF leak? First is to confirm like whether there is leak or not. And uh, it's not only necessary to confirm, we need to tell the site to the surgeon. Because uh, nowadays, previously they used to grow, uh, uh, they used to do a craniotomy approach. So no nowadays, uh, they do a conservative management, they wait. And uh, after that, uh, even if it is uh, a positive leak and uh, patient, like uh, in view of uh, avoiding future uh, episodes of meningitis and uh, other infective causes. So they do a trans spinoidal or a trans endoscopic trans nasal patch gel foam patch or they just do a dural patch repair 